So I neglected to introduce myself, and so I'm going to correct that. Uh, my name is Carolyn Connor. I am a member of the SES New Mexico Board, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce, <laughs> she's amazing, um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce a number, my, my fellow board member, uh, Dan Winsky. He is, he serves as our vice president. Um, he is also a person who has spent a great deal of time in his life t uh, thinking deeply about these science and faith issues. And as many of you in this audience, he's very active in um, in, work, in helping to spur conversation about it, to get us together to talk about these larger issues. And, and for that, I am very grateful for what he does in the community. Dan Winsky is a retired fellow of the Los Alamos National Laboratory. He received his Bachelor of Science from Purdue University, his Master's of Science, and PhD from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, all of which were in physics. At the laboratory, he spent more than 30 years as a theoretical and computational plas plasma physicist, specializing in space physics and defense applications. In retirement, he still remains somewhat active. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society and of the American Geophysical Union. He is a member of our local Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish and a founding member of the Los Alamos Faith and Science Forum and of course, where he serves as president, and of course I mentioned he is the vice president of SCS New Mexico, so quite active. Please help me welcome Dan. He's going to be speaking about <laughs> transhumanism, superhighway, rocky road, or Christian pathway to the future. I'll try not to spill this. Uh, thank you very much. I, I want to make one comment before I start. Uh, Marty's talk was, gave a really excellent talk, and at the end you were mentioning this question about miracles, and I would not like to mention Michael Denon, who is here, who's giving a talk this afternoon. If you've ever read his book, Divine Science, it's got a great chapter on miracles, okay? I don't know if you, I hope you brought some copies of your book to sell, but... They're too heavy for the plane, but you can get it so easily on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so I'm going to talk about transhumanism. I'll explain what it is. And, what my title means here. I want to say right off the start that um, uh, it's all out with yours. Uh, that an earlier version of this talk was given at, at our Los Alamos Faith and Science Forum last year, uh, co-authored by Bob Rynofsky, and uh, so I'll use, be using some of his slides in this talk. Okay, so what is transhumanism? Uh, it's a loosely defined there's a Wikipedia definition. It's a loosely, loosely defined cultural, intellectual, and technical movement that seeks to overcome fundamental human limitations like death, aging, and natural physical, mental, and psychological limitations using bio, nano, information, and wireless technologies. That's a, that's a, a mouthful there. Uh, I'm not going to... I'm hardly at all going to mention technology. I'm going to instead focus on moral and ethical ways to the future. Okay, and I'm going to talk about essentially three ways of going towards the future. One is a super highway approach, and this is based on the work of uh, Yuval Harari. Uh, many of you um, perhaps have read his book *Sapiens*. This is another book of his called *Homo Deus*, and it's transhumanism carried to extremes. The second uh, way of looking at it is what I call the Rocky Road Path, and this is Alistair McGrath, okay? Um, and he talks about the limitations imposed by human nature on transhumanism. And the third way is a sort of a more of a Christian or Catholic, Catholic pathway, uh, and I'll talk about the perspectives from that, okay? Um, but what I want to do f first, okay, I, I can't resist doing this, okay? Being in this room, you know, many of you know that this this building was part of the boys' school before um, uh, the laboratory, uh, before uh, Los Alamos came into being in 1943, you know, and they were going to build the atomic bomb here, and they needed a place, and so Oppenheimer found, you know, he had been here before, and he knew about this place, and so uh, they, the uh, U.S. government took it over, and General Groves was here running the thing, and the, there's a statue of Groves and Oppenheimer outside the building over there. And many of you know 
that, uh, you know, this was sort of a, the social interaction room that, you know, was not part of the laboratory per se, but all the people who were living on various places used to come here and have dances and stuff. And there's a piano here. It's not the same piano, but that's where Edward Teller used to go try to play the piano. And uh, the thing is, during the war here, you know, during the war years, across the street here where the pond is, there used to be buildings all around there. And that's where, in some of those buildings, you know, there were big rooms of technicians, many of whom were women, and they were using old, you know, very old adding machines and whatever they called those old, uh, what? Marchand. whatever they are, but they were calculating, you know, uh, cross sections and so on, and so there's a whole slew of people like that, okay? And so in 1944 or something, if somebody was in here giving a talk about transhumanism at that time, what would he do? He'd pull this thing out of his pocket, and everybody would be amazed. And you'd say, you know, someday, this is where the future's going to be 70, 50, 70 years from now, and the computing power in this little gadget is going to be thousand, a million times what's over there. And besides that, you can connect this thing to any place in the world. And people would just say, ah, oh, that can't possibly be true. Yes, that, that case, OK? Well, that's what I'm talking about in this talk, OK? I'm going to, I want to talk about Yuval Harari's, uh, basically, the superhighway approach. I mean, many of you know uh, Harari. He's an Israeli. Um, he claims to be a Buddhist. Uh, he uh, has a PhD in history from Oxford. He's a professor uh, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And he's written three very successful books, one of which, which was uh, Sapiens. And then this other book is called uh, Homo Deus which is his view of the future, okay? And he stresses three points, what, where humanity is gonna go, and what does humanity want? Immortality, happiness, and divinity, okay? And so you'll hear these three terms throughout my talk, okay? And this is going to lead to a new species, okay? Through technology of transhumanism, Homo sapiens will morph over into a new species which he calls Homo deus, okay? And actually, this is really, when you go from one species to another, that's really not transhumanism, that's really posthumanism. The other thing is, um, transhumanism is sometimes referred to as a political and a cultural movement, to per, uh, a bunch of people who want to produce long lived superhumans who will live long enough to abandon the earth before the sun dies. Uh, Maury will tell us later about what happens at the end, but to go off and establish colonies elsewhere in the universe. So sometimes when you hear the word transhumanism, that's what it refers to. Okay, so what does Harari say, okay, about these, these three ideas, okay? First of all, let's talk about wh where Harari says we are now, okay? He says, you know, when we talk about humanism, uh, Steve talked about materialism yesterday, but a lot of people would refer to it more as humanism, namely, this is where uh, most of the most of human civilization is nowadays. Okay, and this is based on on what what has developed over the last 300 years. The, you know, the worship of humans. Okay, uh, conquer, how we've conquered the world, and but it's the future of the past. It's based on ideas and hopes from the last 300 years. You know, if you read Stephen uh, Pinker's book on. Um, and, uh, enlightenment now, okay? It's based on, on this old, old ideas, okay? And humanism finds its meaning without a great cosmic plan. You don't have to worry about God in any sense, okay? And our modern, the modern world culture embraces this. It experiences and desires of humans give meaning to the cosmos. And the new sources of authority come from accessing and gaining new knowledge and the important role of science in all of this in creating economic growth. And, you know, Harari says, you know, this way of living and civilization in the last couple hundred years, we've, especially in the last hundred years, we've solved the big problems, okay? We've solved famine, we've solved plague and disease. Of course, this book was written before the pandemic, but that's a small, small blip on the screen. Okay, and pretty much we've, you know, we've had big wars and we're probably not going to go that route again, maybe. Okay, and the real future, however, is ideas and hopes from our century, not 
not from the last three centuries, and this may be different from what people thought about in the last 300 years, and it's going to be sort of the, the death of, the, of humanism. And so his three goals, here's the first goal. The first goal is immortality, okay? And the idea is, he says, well, death, death is a technical glitch, okay? You, you just need to find solutions to this, okay? And, and here's, here's a recent book by Chip Walter, okay, called Immortality, Inc., okay? And he talks about ongoing venture capitalism investments to find solutions to this problem, okay? I mean, there are, you, you can actually sign up if you've got enough money, and you can have your brain frozen, or you can have your body frozen. So right when you die, these guys are going to show up with a big refrigerator truck, put you in there, take you someplace for 100 years or 200 years, and then thaw you out, and the idea is that Medicine and science has advanced so much in the last 200 years that you'll be able to just, you know, be re reconstructed and just go on with your life. Okay, and you haven't missed much. You can read about what happened over the last <laughs> 200 years and be happy you weren't there. Okay, um, I don't have to go back here. Okay, and uh, anyway, so you know the writing is on the wall, and, the, and you know what Harari believes, and this is most important is equality is out, okay? Not everybody is gonna do this, I'm sorry. Only a few folks are gonna make it, but you might be one of the lucky ones, okay? And the more modest goal, you know, let's just think about doubling life expectancy, okay? Uh, and um, modern medicine, you know, it, it doesn't really extend your life, but it prevents premature death. You can just look at it that way. And, you know, and the reason people like this is because many people indeed are afraid of death and afraid of dying, and they don't want things to end. So that's his first goal. Second goal is happiness, okay? Uh, people believe that, you know, they have a right to happiness. And Epicurus, of course, he's a Greek guy from many, many years ago, there's a sculpture of him. Happiness is the sole purpose of life. It's a personal quest, but it's hard work to be happy. Okay, there's glass ceilings to this. Psychology says happiness is is reached when reality matches expectations. And biology says happiness is determined by biochemistry. Freedom from pain will lead to pleasure, and pleasure will lead to happiness, okay? So global happiness is, you know, re-engineering homo sapiens so we can enjoy everlasting pleasure and this happiness. You know, this guy's a historian, okay? He's not a scientist, okay? But, you know, he, he's very successful. We, we wish we could all write a book that sold 10 million copies, but. Okay, his third goal, third goal is divinity. Divinity. To overcome old age and miseries, humans will have to acquire godlike control of their biological substrate. Okay? Bioengineering. We have to alter the genetic code, biochem, do rebalancing of your biochemistry, rewire your brain, do cyborg engineering, you know, bionic hands and artificial eyes. Some of this stuff, of course, is already going on. And, you know, engineering of, of your non-organic parts, you know, your mind functions and intelligent softwares and stuff. And, you know, it sounds crazy, but, you know, the stuff that's in your phone, maybe that the next couple, 50 years from now, all of this stuff will be a chip that'll just get stuck in your brain somehow. And then, you know, and for us older folks, you know, who are losing our memory. This is just absolutely wonderful. It's just like when you, when you call up Siri on your phone and you ask something, she immediately comes back with an answer. And so um, that would be really great. And so, but you know, this, this bid for divinity, it's going to be a step-by-step -step process, upgrading the self, merging with robots and computers, and as I say, going to this new species called Homo Deus. And, but Arari says, you know, we're going to reach for these things, even if it kills us. And maybe it will. OK. So, so what, is beyond, what, is, what is his view of the future? Okay, um, that new technology is needed because our ideas at the present time, democracy, free market, human rights, it's too slow to survive, okay? And you know, we, we tried to do this, let's face it, we tried to do this in Afghanistan, right? And it actually didn't work very well. So anyway, these ideas are just too slow to survive. And our threats is that the, humans are going to lose value completely. I mean, they will still be valued collectively, but we'll lose individual authority. 
Some people, as I said, will remain both indispensable and undecipherable. They'll have unheard of abilities and unprecedented creativity. What's going to happen to the rest of us? The rest of us will be treated as we now treat pets and animals. Okay, I mean, computer games, plenty of food, junk food probably, you know, it's, and, you know, uh, but there won't be anything to do because, you know, all, all this, these really smart guys and computers are going to be doing everything and the rest of us will just be there. Okay, so that's why I say Harari doesn't have a very high regard for, for humanity generally. So, and medicine, again, is going to be to upgrade the healthy and the wealthy. And so, and the solutions to all of this are going to be new technical religions, okay? Uh, technical humanism is just going to be this post-humanism, the new, the new uh, species. Dataism is going to be the data, is going to be treat all of this data as a kind of a religion. And then the internet of all things, it's going to, everything is going to be all processed together on a grand global scale. And that's uh, going to be what's going to substitute for God in the, in the future. Okay, well, that's the super highway approach, okay? And, you know, you, if you are, want to jump on, you can. Okay, Alistair McGrath, okay? Uh, many of you have, I hope, have read some of his books. He's excellent. He's Irish. He's an Anglican priest. He's a theologian and he's a historian. He has a PhD in chemistry from Oxford. And he's a professor of divinity at Gresham College. In the UK, he's written a number of really great books on science and religion. Okay, and one of them is called *The Great Mystery*. Okay, and he considers in this book the social, moral, ethical, and religious aspects that place limits on the future of humanity. Okay, and the, this limitation. Uh, the, the limitation of human nature uh, places more restrictions than any limitations that are imposed by technology, okay? The human longing for immortality, okay? What does that mean? That, you know, for many people, that means the quest to escape being what we are now, and we want to be something beyond what we are now, and we want to get way, way far away from where we are now to something else. The human quest for happiness, okay? Uh, you know, there's this myth that things are getting better and better all the time, okay? Uh, but, you know, it's, at some level it's true, but it's not true at every level. And thirdly, the human aspiration to divinity, okay? And this, this is counteracted by what he calls the human dilemma. We like to think we are fundamentally good, but as we know, uh, that's not totally true. So let's go through these real quick, okay? But this quest to escape, the fundamental limitations of being human. The human longing for immortality. We are driven by the desire to deny death, transcend it, or create meaning in its space. Perhaps our longing for paradise is actually a desire to escape the limits of being human, transcending our biological origins through technological enhancement. Transhumanists often assume that technological augmentation of natural human cognitive capabilities will lead to moral excellence. But maybe not. Uh, most of the questions about transhumanism do not concern how, how it can be done, but whether it should be done. Okay? This, this is very fundamental ethical questions. The myth of progress, the same thing. Things are getting better, or are they? The dominant narrative of Western culture during and since enlightenment is that of progress and the perception that progress reduces pain. Things are not simply changing, they're getting better, and that leads to a greater level of satisfaction. Well, without a doubt, there are constant improvements in human society and social conditions through advances in science, understanding, and technology, as many of us here in this room know from, from our work on science. But maintaining the reality and the perception of process of progress is a tricky thing. And it depends critically upon identifying the right goal and doing what is necessary to move ourselves and others towards it. Okay? And of course, uh, when you get a bunch of people in a room and so on, we don't always identify the right goal and we don't even 
know what direction to move. So linking human happiness to the questionable concept of unlimited progress seems to miss much of what brings meaning and richness to life and to the future. Okay, so it's, these things are not at all, all clear that they can go ahead. And then finally, the human dilemma, the human propensity to engage in evil. One difficulty with an aspiration to divinity as a future for humanity is the troubling persistence of evil, and we all know that. Unlike millions of species that disappear in extinction events, humans alone seem to devote effort and energy to bringing about our own destruction. McGrath reminds us that we need to face up to the fact that as species, human beings use violence, injustice, and oppression to achieve our own aims and we, and, and we use technology to extend the reach of that violence. Okay. And then we'll hear from Ray this afternoon, who's going to talk about the ultimate solution to some of these things and whether it's for good or for evil. We don't know. Okay. So I'm going to end here with, you know, a third pathway. Okay. I mean, you, I've already presented a very forward-looking thing, and this question. Well, no, we probably aren't going to get there because of sin and our own human weaknesses. But of course, you know, uh, the problem with just saying that is, you know, the bus is, the train has left the station, okay? And transhumanism is, and progress is going forward. So the question is, how, how do we react to all of this? Of course, if you're interested in immortality, happiness, and divinity, the short answer is Jesus, okay? We all know that, okay? And it wouldn't surprise me that that Harari knew this when he started, and he said, well, you know, let's throw this guy out, and how can we get to these things without? And that wouldn't surprise me that's how he came up with these three ideas. Uh, anyway, what we need is sort of modest transhumanism, okay? We are going to be doing improving science, and so science will continue to improve and, uh, and new advances in medicine and so on will come about. And we also have to have a broadening worldview so that whatever advancements we are making and improvements we're making applies to everyone on the planet, just not to just a few people. Okay, and so instead of immortality, we should be just be thinking of a more meaningful life. And instead of happiness, we should be thinking about a more bountiful life. And of course, divinity is eternal life with God. Okay, um, there's of course our Lord, and here's, you know, from John. Uh, but Harari has an answer for this, okay, even in his book. He said, prayer, good deeds, and meditation might be comforting and inspiring, but problems such as famine, plague, and war can only be solved through growth. If you have a problem, you probably just need more stuff. In order to have more stuff, you must produce more of it, okay? And so that's, you know, his solution to this kind of thing, but, you know, we know better than that. And so if we just think about a more meaningful life, for the Christian, transhumanism becomes really transhumanization through living and growing in Christ, not in developing through technology. Of course, we agree that technology needs to be developed, but we know basically what needs to be done. And we must keep in mind we have a future seen only through the eyes of faith, a faith, a vision of a more meaningful life here on earth and something more beyond. And we need to ask seriously the question of what constitutes a good human life rather than the benefits of a longer life, okay? I mean, those of us who are getting long in the tooth, you know, we're thinking, yeah, you know, another 20 years? Great idea. Um, here's, a, here's a recent book that uh, just came out, The Transhuman Code, okay? And this book claims that the important thing is to learn to put humans first ahead of technology. That sounds great. But if you read through the book, there's seven guiding principles, okay, that are based on the individual, like individual privacy, identity, ability, and democracy. But none of these guiding principles are at all religiously oriented, okay? I think it's because these two authors, Moriera and Ferguson, are entrepreneurs, okay? So they're, you know, they're out to make some money. I don't think they actually have an idea of actually doing anything. Um, yeah. Oh, wait, I, I'm sorry, we're so long back. Okay, so in happiness, I mean, a more bountiful life is what we want. We want innate, the innate human drive toward continuous improvement for healthier and happier lives. As scientists, we recognize and contribute to the development, improvement, and use of science and technology, 
to relieve suffering, help the disabled, and improve life universally. And we want to promote, we want to promote the dignity of all humans, our divine inheritance having been created in the image of God. We all know that. Pope Francis said, you can have a better world through technology if accompanied by an ethic inspired by a division of the common good. And uh, the Vatican actually has a organization of some sort called Humanity 2.0, and it includes something called the Global Wellness Platform. I actually don't know what any of these things are, and it presumably is drawn from, drawn from uh, the Pope's uh, encyclical Laudato, Laudato Si. Uh, also, uh, Jim Stump, who is the vice president of BioLogos, which is a very uh, large uh, faith and science organization, questions transhumanism via the Christian viewpoint, okay? He asks, is transhumanism conducive to the abundant life? Will it help us love our neighbor more? And will it help us take better care of the least of these? These are all very important questions, as we know. And of course, finally, divinity or the eternal life of God in heaven, the completion of the human, Christian humanization process is meant for a future life, an eternal life of intimacy with God. As Catholics and Christians, we have hope grounded in the word of God and on the work, work of Christ. We believe that this life is not the end, that death has been defeated and our bodies will be resurrected to a new imperishable life. Christ's life provides the pathway to transcendence final state achieved through patience, perseverance, repentance, discipleship, self-denial, committed love, and generous self-giving. That, that, that's not super highway. That's just toughen it out step by step. All right, so here's my summary. Okay, we have thinking about trans the future of humanity. There are sort of three ways to go, okay? You, Yuval Harari is talking about a superhighway approach, super technology, pushing it forward, a few people benefiting. Everyone else is going to become a pet or an animal. That's okay. There's going to be immortality, happiness, and divinity for some people. Could be you. I don't know. We're all kind of old friends, maybe. But anyway, <laughs> the alternative is Alistair McGrath, who's an Anglican priest. You know, he basically says, well, you know, this is not, sounds good, but you know, the basic tendency of humans, he doesn't use the word sin, but we could use the word sin, okay? That, you know, we have want to escape where we are, and we believe that things are always going to get better, and we're going to make it, and we believe, you know, this human dilemma that, you know, we're basically good guys, and you know, it's going to happen, but we're really not that good, and Things are really aren't really as good as we think they are. And, you know, things just, you weren't going to quite make it. But Christ says, of course, you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he has a, you know, a clear path for a meaningful life, a more bountiful life, and an eternal life. What's the problem here, okay? The choice is yours, okay? Um, I hope you'll, you know, where to choose, but, you know, that's my story. Thank you. We actually have a generous amount of time for lunch, so we have plenty of time to take a few questions, and so I'd love to entertain them. Steve. Oh, yeah, so in some sense, the first transhumanist, uh, it, 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 the scriptural terms were, were Adam and Eve, oh, okay. because they grasped at divinity in a sense. Mm -hmm. they, they tried to, they tried to, to seize on, on divinity. And, right, you know, sure. What right. Whereas St. Paul, I forget, is that Philippians? Or, mm -hmm. uh, Whereas we know that Christ is the mirror image of that. He did not see divinity as something to be grasped at, but emptied himself mm -hmm. to humble himself. But I think that's an interesting mm -hmm. way of looking at transhumanism. But also, in a sense, well, Christ redefined happiness. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the word, I mean, Aristotle in Aristotelian ethics, which is also subsumed mm -hmm. into St. Thomas. Yeah. To be good is to is also to be happy, mm -hmm. to fulfill oneself as a human being, mm -hmm. and to achieve happiness. And I'm told by a friend who knows these things that the word that Aristotle used is the same for happiness, <clears throat> is the same word that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount 
uh, which also means blessed. So sometimes the Sermon on the Mount is translated happier those oh, yeah, sure. right. or blessed. Mm -hmm. right. But in a sense, Christ is completely turned upside down the very notion of what it is to be happy. Mm -hmm. It is not material abundance. Right. Yeah, sure. so it's not bountifulness in the sense of acquiring oh, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, so I think that is something that mm -hmm. uh, okay. it has to be a redefinition of what mm -hmm. we mean okay. by happy, which oh, yeah, is sure. radically different mm -hmm. for a Christian than for, say, uh, a mm -hmm. Right. Good. Thank yeah. you. Yes. You know, I, I, this is probably going to be more of a comment than a question, but sure. I really, really like the way you did the talk and presented it because I don't know why it's never struck me before, but like Harari's views and that trans, that extreme transhumanism really just doesn't understand the question of time scales and, and the finiteness of the universe anyway, mm -hmm. right? That there is a good way. But in a sense, that view is almost irrelevant. Yes, yeah, so we managed to put ourselves in computers. Let's just suppose we could do that. There is still death, there is still time scales, entry still exists, the universe is still accelerating, and it doesn't answer any of the questions Christ answers. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and so I really like having the three next to it. And it's kind of building on you said Stephen, right? Like it, it just shows a whole bunch of critical questions under the rug and says, you know, if you're lucky and you live a lot longer, then you'll probably be happy. Mm -hmm. Right? Which just seems to really fall apart when you say it that way. <laughs> so anyway, it was thank you for that. It was just very illuminating I mean, to put the three together. I mean, yeah. One thing to take away from Harari is, you know, his books felt tense and Well, yeah. Well, I have to read my book to make it Maybe, maybe, you, need, maybe, maybe you need to juice up your book a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was interesting to have you separate uh, the look at the future into those three different parts, but you didn't address the fact that in reality what's going to happen is all three of those are going to go forward at the same time. Mm. Uh, and uh, people who are trying to do number one of those, uh, the Chinese guy, uh, this, even at that society, said, no, you can't do that, and they put him in jail and what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it seems like there's going to be a challenge for uh, religious people mm -hmm. to really try to influence uh, all those other things, because those other things are going to happen. There are a lot of people in the world who don't think anything of religion and just want to go ahead. Right. Uh, could you sure. comment on that? I mean, that, I think since the, as Steve was saying, since the beginning of time, there are people who want to go ahead, right, and, you know, and try to push ahead beyond what everyone else is thinking now. Some of those guys are, you know, perhaps pushing us ahead to good things or bad things. I mean, people, you know, like myself, I, I would never, right now, I would never want to drive a self-driving self car, you know, like a Tesla, okay? 
but other people apparently have moved beyond that. You're going to love it. You're going <laughs> to come, come for a ride in my car. <laughs> All right, uh, but you know, but to, you know, some people just want to have you know control of these things, and other people say, well, no, you don't really need to have control because the car's smarter than you are. And I don't know. Is that going to be true? I don't know. I mean, I, the car's going down the road, okay? And on, on one side of the, the one half of the road, there's a cow crossing the road, okay? And you might say, oh, well, I got to go around this way and avoid heating the car. But there's a guy riding a bicycle on the shoulder, okay? Uh, is he going to be able, is the car, is uh, software in the car going to be able to figure that? Or does you just have to grab this? You don't believe how fast it stops. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. She puts her foot out. Oh my God, look how fast we're stopping today. Okay. I don't know. But anyway, you know, I mean, these are all, you know, issues. And, and I, you know. So on the note of self-driving cars, let's thank Dan. Oh.